Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, March 21st. Today's topic is Eyewitness Multimedia Lessons for High School and Middle School Using Testimony of Genocide Survivors. Our special guest is Dr. Corey Street. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for doing the closed captioning for us. Uh, Dr. Street is the Director of Education at the USC Shoah Foundation, the Institute for Visual History and Education. As such, she defines and directs the national and international education agenda for the Institute, including the award-winning eyewitness program. Prior to joining the Institute, Dr. Street was, asso was Associate Professor and Chair at Mount Royal University where she was responsible for the development of a number of courses focused on the history and representation of the Holocaust, as well as leading a number of curriculum development programs that develop course offerings on genocide. So I'll now ask the newbie question, how do videos help make learning more personal and authentic for students? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. And this question is one that's close to our heart, and it's one that we'll continue to unpack as the session goes on. But primarily, how our videos, how our audiovisual testimonies make learning more personal and authentic for students is that they develop a relationship with the individuals on the screen. So because they're interactive, because they're giving a first-person story, a first-person narrative, students get engaged with the story, they develop a virtual and um, bordering onto a real relationship with the individuals and the learning becomes very relevant to them and that's what our evaluation shows and that's what we see every day we work in classrooms with students. <coughs> All right. Okay, I've managed to cover up the little arrows with my chat. There is the problem. All right, so we thought we would uh, take everyone through Eyewitness 101, and I will try not to get distracted by the uh, chat. So if uh, there's anything, um, any questions or comments that, um, uh, Peggy, you feel like I need to draw my attention to, I'd be delighted if you would do that. So really what we're going to talk about today is utilizing the testimonies in education. And one of the questions we got before the start of the, um, the session was really about what age groups is this appropriate for. And we do have uh, teachers using the testimonies with students as young as in grade two and moving all the way up through graduate school. So eyewitnesses getting use across disciplines, across age groups, and around the world. In fact, we have over 40,000 users in 59 different countries right now. So it's a, um, uh, and they're using it for a wide variety of, um, wide variety of uh, teaching things that we couldn't have imagined uh, when we first started this. Um, I'd like to start with this moment. This is um, the USC Shoah Foundation's mission statement, and. We've actually just changed it yesterday. Um, it's not uh, it's not public yet. We haven't changed all the documents. So Rob, you might even be surprised. But the um, mission is now to overcome prejudice, intolerance, and hatred, and the suffering they cause through the educational use of the testimonies. And I love this photograph. Uh, Steven Spielberg was our founding. Um, he was our founder uh, some 20 years ago. In the wake of filming Schindler's List, he realized that the testimonies of witnesses and survivors of the Holocaust had to be preserved in perpetuity. And that purpose has been expanded to bring in testimonies of witnesses and survivors of other genocides or violations, massive violations of human rights, such as happened in the Nanjing Massacre. So we've, in the process of taking additional testimonies in China, but we do have 10 testimonies already about the Nanjing Massacre and those engaged. And this is, I think, a very timely message in our world, but this notion of working with digital and, uh, media with students at all ages to leverage the power of these voices of the past to make them relevant in the present and help students make better choices, we hope, for the future. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
The Visual History Archive, which is the largest audiovisual archive in the world, has over 52,000 testimonies, which works out to about 109,000 hours. So if we started to watch them back to back, uh, it'd take us about 13 years in order to uh, watch every testimony from start to finish. They're taken in the local language, and they were taken by over 2,000 interviewers, 1,000 videographers throughout the world. And this was a massive undertaking. But I think from an education point of view, what's really important is not only were these uh, survivor and witness testimonies taken, and we continue to take them, but they were also preserved for perpetuity, but indexed to the minute in a set of keywords. So we have a fixed language set of keywords that allows for these testimonies to be discoverable for students and teachers. So you don't have to watch the full testimony. They average about two hours, but some are as long as 18 hours. As you can imagine, assigning that to a two-year, uh, you know, a grade five or six or a grade twelve, even they're probably not going to um, have that dedicated time to do a close reading of a two or three-hour testimony. But if you're interested in a particular topic, you can go right to that topic um, and watch um, clips that are in the context of the greater interview. So that discoverability is what's so important. Now, the Visual History Archive is full of testimonies. And what testimonies are, and this is important, because it's a first hand, we, we, this is a, from a, a film, one of our connections videos on eyewitness, um, a first hand authentication of a fact evidence. It's a primary source. It's one person's individual remembering of a series of time of events in that period of time. Now our testimonies were started to we started to take our testimonies in 1994. And that, again, is of the, the um, primarily of those that either witnesses, liberators, or survivors of the Holocaust. So in 1994, we're you know, a few years past the event. So our body of evidence, if you will, is largely of people who experienced that event as young people. And young people would have a very different remembering than someone who had greater life experience. So we talk a lot in terms of utilizing the testimonies about the notion of um, what the nature of the testimonies are. And I just want to, just as we get started, I'm going to um, ask Peggy to drop in a clip of a testimony just so we can get a sense, a shared sense of what this medium brings to the classroom. So, Peggy, let's go ahead and drop in Kurt. Old man, tiny old gentleman. But there were people standing around, 40, 50 people and two of the Sturmabteilung, the SA, not SS, SS are the one in, in the black uniforms, and, the, um, and these are the, bra excuse me, the brown shirts. Uh, of course, with all their equipment, and they forced this very old gentleman to pick up the tiny glass splitters one by one. And they forced this man to do this. And they all were standing there and watching. We didn't know what to think. But the only thing we could think of, the only thing we could think of, was help. So we put our bicycles down. Rudy and I, we went in front of that group that was surrounding this old gentleman went down on our knees and started picking up the glass slippers one by one to help this man. Briefly I looked at the two guys. They didn't blink. They didn't move. Why did they not move? I asked myself. Are they afraid that the people might agree with us? Or not, I have never figured out what it was. But I am sure in this particular situation that some of the people standing there disapproved of what the Nazis did. But their disapproval was only silence. 
and silence is what did the harm. As well intended as the silence is, it didn't do any good. So this was very, very horrible experience, but at least we made the most of it. We did something positive, as insignificant as it might seem. Now I'm just going to close my mouth. Okay, so I hope that most of you got to hear and to watch Kurt. Uh, I know it's a, always a, a challenge, but just that you know, two two and a half minutes is so powerful in terms of having students see something and hear something and talk about something that's quite relevant to their day-to-day -day lives, sadly. And this is a testimony clip that we use in our eyewitness video challenge to help motivate students to think about what they can do. And it doesn't have to be, when we talk to them about engaging, it doesn't have to be a grand act. Sometimes it's just about speaking up, it's just about helping. Now going back to the nature of testimony, so you can, you're, you're seeing and listening to someone's recounting of a particular episode um, in their lives. And so what we're dealing with is memory. And it's important, and we, and we talk about this in a, in a number of ways through the connections videos and other spaces, the testimonies themselves are memories. And memories come in many different ways. We have institutional memory, um, a concept known as collective memory, and also individual memory. And we're dealing with individual memory, but individual memory is impacted by the other types of memory. And it's important to think about that when teachers are deploying testimonies in their classroom. So we often recommend that the deployment is about understanding the human experience, the universal human experience, often in these historically specific moments, as opposed to using them as the the space you're going to look for um, facts. So these are evidence, it's a primary source that needs to be unpacked like any other primary source. And we have a number of activities that actually help students read audiovisual testimony and read other video as a primary source, which I know is something very important to many of you in the high school and also middle school with the new Common Core standards um, and expectations for competencies. And this is one of the points that I like to make. So we have this great collection of audiovisual testimonies. And they sit for us educationally at what we call an intersection. And it's an intersection between history, because they are recounting the events of the 20th uh, century and some of the testimonies we're taking now, the 21st century. It also stands to talk about the universal human experience and not just the human experience of the events themselves. So one of the things that's so powerful about our testimony collection is that these are really life histories. These are testimonies that when we take them, we went to their homes, we sat down with them, and they talked to us about their lives before the war, during the war, and after the war. One of the testimonies um, I was looking at recently is of a woman in New York on 9-11. So her testimony was scheduled to be taken that afternoon. And she's the first th four or five minutes of her testimony is talking about what's happened that morning just down the street from her and how she's making sense of that with and you know not knowing very much of what happened yet not understanding it but how she's making sense of that at a moment where she's come to give her testimony about surviving the holocaust so it's a very powerful moment a very real moment of something that was very timely it also the testimonies themselves helps us to um address curricular requirements, whether those are common core state standards or others, but also transliteracy. So helping students become more literate um, around media, 
digital resources, but also information literacy, because this is also a, a powerful um, research tool and um, uh, search tool. And also, as you'll see when we get into eyewitness more, um, what are the more traditional literacies. And we do a lot of work with a colleague here um, at USC, Henry Jenkins, where we really think of these newer norms of literacy and how eyewitness can help teachers and students um, start to gain strength in these areas. This rather busy slide is what we call um, our working theory of change. And I like to talk a little bit about it because often I know when we speak to teachers, and as I said, we speak to teachers all over the world, what we often get is that, that moment of like, oh, this seems like a really great resource and you know, it looks like it would really work. And we say it would really work, but we also provide evidence. Being at a research university, we have the great, great opportunity to be able to develop um, evalu robust evaluation programs to demonstrate that our, our, our educational outreach is working towards our mission. And what we talk about in education is we want to provide students with the competencies, capacities, and knowledge to become more responsible participants in a civil society. So when we look at that, when they work with testimony, they're developing insight, they're developing a commitment um, to um, to a better world, if you will, and then they're being motivated to act or even acting. So in the concept, when we're thinking about the fundamentals of genocide, these interventions can really help us move to a space where students are contributing to um, uh, those, the behavioral change that can go on where students start to contribute to making that change. So if we talk about learning outcomes for any of our activities that we build, we start with, yes, there's an expectation that students will develop subject matter knowledge. And they do that in a variety of ways. Either those are specific outcomes or in order to appropriately engage with the testimony, they need to know the context, whether it's historical um, or disciplinary. They're developing critical thinking, a respect for other worldviews. Eyewitness provides the opportunity for teachers to bring in perspectives on a specific topic from, uh, I mean, in Eyewitness, we have 1,500 testimonies in 16 different languages. So you can really bring in um, a wide variety of perspectives on an issue. They develop empathy. And then they're motivated to act. We also measure that they act. And I'll talk a little bit about this. But if we can get through those learning outcomes, a student does present as a more responsible participant. So they are asking good questions. They are developing arguments as opposed to opinions. They are thinking about others in an empathetic way. And they are, are respecting that they, they have their own authentic role in society and others as with, uh, with others as well. So every activity has a particular scope and sequence where we ask them to consider material, historical context, contemporary context, disciplinary context, get into the archive and collect material themselves, so developing those information literacy skills, and then they construct something. It's very important for students to bring their own voice to this, and then they communicate with each other, so it's that peer-to-peer -peer learning that can be so powerful. So those four C's are implicated through those um, all of our activities and eyewitness. And Glenn, I'm, I'm glad you're late because you dozed off and that you haven't dozed off while I'm speaking. So that's, that's excellent because when I was a history professor, that used to happen all the time. Um, so let's talk about eyewitness. So this, um, what you're seeing on your page is the um, uh, educational platform from the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation. And eyewitness is freely available to teachers and their students anywhere in the world that you have internet. And when we talk back about the, that visual history archive, that massive archive of 52 going on 53,000 testimonies, this is a subset of that. All right, so in this case, more isn't always necessarily better. We want a representative sample that gives teachers and students an engagement with the testimonies without um, access to all of them. It was originally planned and, and designed with teachers, middle school and high school teachers um, uh, feedback. It, that was its original market. Now, as I said, it's being used by primary and tertiary teachers. And it was also designed for English language, so primarily um, Western Europe and North America. 
However, we're seeing uh, use in 59 countries. And what we're finding is it could be that someone's looking for compelling material and learning English. It's also the stories themselves. So that's why we started to add foreign language activities and testimonies to Eyewitness. So it is a, um, uh, a, what we call a, a walled garden, so it is an educational space. There is a, a login process, a registration process. Um, but before I talk about that, I just wanted to unpack some of the, the findings we're getting. So we've got a data set of over a thousand students now. Um, in seven different countries, and in every occasion of every time we use eyewitness in these environments, students are reporting and demonstrate increases in knowledge, uh, sometimes quite significant. Um, uh, they're demonstrating in their um, activities as well as in their own feelings of um, uh, their own uh, self-identification, uh, higher levels of critical thinking. We're also seeing, and we'll talk about this one more, that they're respecting others more. So this is an example of um, in one activity after one day with us, um, there was a decline by 61% that students in that classroom felt that a stereotype was a way to explain an individual's difference. It's also more important um, they're showing empathy and that they're moving to a place where they want to do something. And I think that's something we can all um, look at. And I want to talk a little bit more about um, Ruth Hernandez. And Ruth, uh, you can see her video in the live binder, her winning video from the Eyewitness Video Challenge last year. But Ruth's one of those students. She's at a school in Philadelphia um, that's, I think, 98% Latino, and Ruth was um, is a is a a daughter of a family who's dealing firsthand with the immigration um, challenges that face the United States right now. Um, she she has members in her family who are undocumented. So as an, uh, as a, that daughter um, that child of a community where um, being undocumented being found out is her Not surprisingly, Ruth didn't have much of a voice. She always tried to stay quiet. She always tried to kind of fly under the radar. She was one of those uh, students where her principal talked about very nice, but you didn't really see her in the classroom or in the hallways because she was always trying to fly under the radar. And certainly, he never expected that she would go to university. So Ruth entered the Eyewitness Video Challenge with her um, help of her teacher as part of her after school getting used to coming to a high school. And she did her video. And the Eyewitness Video Challenge asks students to get inspired by the archive, the voices of the past, and then to go out in their community and do something to make it better. So they're inspired by Kurt Messerschmidt, what he did. How do they use their voice? How do they go out and do something to make a difference? And then create a video about the social value they created. So the activity is not about history, it's about entrepreneurialism, it's about innovation, it's about creative thinking. And what's been fascinating with Ruth is, so she created a video about immigration reform and as part of the contest she came out to our gala and we happened to be honoring President Barack Obama, who she got to meet. And her video was playing at the event um, throughout. So in that video, she asks President Obama to be a stronger, um, to do better with respect to immigration. And if you're familiar, for those of you who are from the, the Pennsylvania or Philadelphia era, um, era, last year, just shortly after um, Ruth's project, and she got her, her colleagues involved, um, she got people involved, they they changed the laws so that the Philadelphia police are no longer working with hand in hand with um, immigration services. So there's been a, a great move so that INS and the police are separated, which makes for a, um, a different conversation. So not only has Ruth, you know, gone, you know, she, she came to LA, she met, met, met the president, um, she found her voice. And what that's translated into in school is that she's now taking AP courses. She's now speaking out in school. She has changed the way she's thinking. So we, she also accompanied us um, on a project we had in Poland this past January. And she was on a flight from Los Angeles to Washington. And she met um, a researcher from another university and spoke to him. 
you know, they had a conversation for a couple of hours, and he decided to apply to the USC Shoah Foundation for a job after speaking to Ruth, because as he said, if our testimonies could make that kind of change in that young woman, he wanted to come and work here, and he's now working in our research area. And she's become articulate, she's reading books that I would um, her mother tells me she never would have picked up before, but she's really become a responsible participant in society, and we have hundreds and thousands of roofs. Um, this is, a, again, going back um, to our research findings. Um, this is an example where we actually asked a teacher in an inner city school, again, most of the students were Latino or African American, if they would help us do a pilot of an activity to see how it works um, with um, an activity that was about contemporary anti-Semitism. And the teacher said, this is not at all relevant, this isn't going to work, but I signed on for this, so you know they'll learn something, this will be fine. Um, so we went through with it, and when we started, the students felt that you know they'd never heard about anti-Semitism, they're unfamiliar with um, the Jewish people, um, they'd never met one, and so they did this activity, and they learned about uh, historical and contemporary anti-Semitism, and most of them felt that a stereotype was something that would help them understand somebody who was different from them, and you can see that number has just plummeted. Um, more importantly, there's a 93% increase from before and after for the students feeling that it was important for them to speak up against stereotyping, and that it was relevant to them. And this is really um, something that's incredibly powerful in the kind of learning. And again, this is one engagement with the testimonies um, through one activity on eyewitness um, over the course of a single day. Um, we work in Rwanda, that's one of our projects, and we took eyewitness to Rwanda, and if you're familiar with the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and the aftermath, it's been about 20 years since the genocide, and the society is still recovering. And the Rwandan government has made a huge commitment to digital literacy. And this classroom here, um, it didn't have any computers in it, in it 12 hours before this moment when I took the photograph. And uh, they got it pulled together. But this is the powerful thing. So they did an activity learning about comparative genocides in Kenya, Rwandan. And Fascinatingly, in the open text responses, one of the students wrote, I always felt like revenging, but I don't want to do it anymore. I am changed. And that's that, that power, and again, we were there for um, one session with them. And now in that school in particular, I continue to get letters asking them um, if you know we're coming back, are they going to do eyewitness again? And this is an example of a word cloud. Uh, one type of the activities we'll talk about, students create a word cloud. And that's the output of the activity. And you can see they're using different languages and coming up with some, and this is just from a close reading of the testimonies. So let's talk about eyewitness and how you use it. So as I said, eyewitness is a, a walled garden. So you register, and then you invite your students in. But uh, before you do that, you also have access to a wide variety of clips that have been curated. And by curated, I mean we found the narrative arc, and we put them up with the kinds of contextual um, material. So what does resistance mean? What's the story about ITCA? Who is ITCA so they understand her experience and can read the testimony appropriately? And we have a growing body of clips. And lots of teachers, in fact, about 65% of our teachers just use the watch page. And they bring in a clip and they discuss it with their classroom. Um, so this is freely available outside the wall. You don't even have to log in or have your students log in. But if you really want to get into the meat of um, eyewitness, you do have to register. It's one-step registration. So educators, you'd click on the register now educator button, fill out the form, and you'd be automatically involved. You provide your students with a key code after you create a group, and you would bring them in to log in. So you're inviting your students in. Um, so it's your virtual classroom, your safe space. When you log in, you come to dashboard. And one of the things that's great for teachers is you have a record of who's logged in when. You also can see all the groups you have set up. And you have access to scaffolding materials, which we call connections videos. And the connections videos help students become more adept at utilizing the audiovisual testimonies um, 
investment in eyewitness. Eyewitness has a search function, so one of the things that you can do um, is just have your students use this for research and search. A lot of the activities ask the students to search the archive. And what's great about this is when they put in a term, it drops down a menu where that term comes up in a variety of different ways. When they scroll over these terms, it actually gives them a definition, so it really helps them develop those information literacy skills. We don't assume that students come in with a strong sense of research or information literacy, so we want to make sure that we're helping them do that. So you can see here, they put in 9-11 and they get um, a history of that to help them understand if this is indeed what they want to look up at that moment. Again, as I said, the, the uh, testimonies themselves are indexed, so when they have found the search term they're looking for, it immediately takes them to that minute of testimony. We also have filters that you can use, so if you're really only looking for someone who's talking about this um, who's male, so you can click on the gender. Um, at the same time, it searches our encyclopedias and our photos, so you can do a, um, a triangulation and help your students learn how to triangulate in terms of research. And yes, so if you, you can't pick a language for the whole site, but you can filter the testimonies by language or country of interview, so you can get that um, specificity. We have, we are in the process of adding um, Google Chrome Translate, and so you can then have that, the page translated. Um, but again, as we know, Google Chrome, uh, our Google Translate is a tool. It's not perfect, but it uh, at least helps those students um, with English language. And the activity, um, when we get into the activities, the videos and the activities um, mostly are closed captioned as well. So we're in the process of making it more um, friendly for those who have, um, who are hearing impaired. So. As you can see, you can build your search, you can save that particular clip, um, it gives you links to other clips, um, but again, it does these searches from the encyclopedias and the photos to help build and deepen students' knowledge. So this is an example. We have three built-in archives right now, the U.S. Um, Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, and the Genocide Archive Rwanda. These are all built in, and when you do a search in Eyewitness, it also searches these archives and brings up related material. So that gives you lots of depth of knowledge. So as I talked about, when you come in as a teacher and you want to invite your students in, you need to create a group. So it's fairly simple, create a name for the group. When you make the group, it generates a key code for you. You give that a key code, um, you give that key code to your students, when they register, they put in the key code. We do not keep any information about your students. That say this is a fake student that I've created in terms of um, a, a group, but you can assess your students, right, in eyewitness. So you can look at their the answers to the questions that they're doing, you can add a comment, you can print the progress report, you can send them the progress report via eyewitness, you can send them a message and say, listen, you know, you're doing a really great job without sending them a full progress report, but that's built right in. Um, we also, in some of the activities, provide rubrics. As I said, with the um, scaffolding is very important to us, and because the students are dealing with a different a medium, you can, we have created what we call connections videos, and we give the teachers and students a chance to engage um, and watch those. So this one's about ethical editing, which is a really important skill for students uh, right now, and particularly if they're going to be editing and making films with, um, with testimony of survivors and witnesses to genocide, we want to make sure they know how to do that ethically. There are three types of activities in eyewitness what we call an information quest, which really gives a chance for students to listen and go deeply into a topic and, and, and draw out information. Mini quest, which is a shorter type of activity, but it's also an activity that you can download, do with pen and paper, do online, do offline, or even put up in your own learning management system. Or a video quest, where students are creating a video. So the primary difference is the, uh, slightly the structure and the student output that what they're building in that. And you can see we have a very robust uh, library and I encourage all of you to have a look at the activity library because you'll see we have 
a variety of activities around a variety of different um, disciplines. So this is one of the examples of a, of a mini quest. That's, this one was built as an offline activity to be used in Rwanda. And it's really about the micro level um, versus the macro level of processes. One of the things that I think is great about Eyewitness is teachers can also build their own activities. And they can take, if you thought this one's almost good for me, um, but I really want to um, make a few changes, you can copy it. You can share it with another colleague, make changes in the map, up and then and have that in your account. So you can take all of the published activities or activities that you share with another colleague and make changes to them. This is what the inside of an activity does, and this is an activity on financial literacy. And we've got these great stories about people making personal economic choices. Um, this one's not published yet, but I think it shows you kind of the, the breadth of what kinds of um, um, things you can think about doing. And you can see these four C's, consider, collect, construct, and communicate. Everything's here. So you have a primary asset, usually video on the left, and then either text or a question that students are filling in on the right. And see so here they would move forward to the next slide and do reflective questions. You can do confirmatory questions. A toolkit is always available. It has their learning names, the requirements, what standards are addressed, as well as any handouts that the students or the teachers need, including a teacher activity guide. Now, this only shows up for the educator. It doesn't show up for the students, but it gives you that kind of support as a teacher to think about how you deploy this in your classroom. We have activities that the outcome or the output that a student does is an art. So there, this art in the face of death is an activity we did in, for the commemoration of the Auschwitz camp, the liberation of the camp, the 70th anniversary this past January. And students listen to artists from the camps, and then they do their own artistic rendering um, to commemorate the activity. And the, the pieces have been beautiful, and this has been done worldwide. The last activity I want to talk about, um, literally because it's going on right now, the Eyewitness Video Challenge. This is the activity I talked about um, with Ruth. Um, this is live now. Um, the competition closes May 8th. I encourage all of you, if you um, have students who would be interested in doing this, uh, the prize is an all-expense paid trip to Los Angeles. Um, and they come and they meet. Um, our staff and um, experience Los Angeles and the University of Southern California. And this activity is really powerful in terms of the learning that takes place. We had over 2,000 students around the world do it, even though the contest itself is only open to uh, students in North America. Um, and we just had a remarkable uh, collection of um, service that was accomplished by middle and high school students around the world last year. Year. So very exciting. Um, again, it's open this spring. The winners will be announced in June. So I think that's my time. I just want to end with um, a short video from a teacher who came with us to Poland. I always think um, it's important for teachers to hear from teachers, um, that same peer-to-peer -peer learning. So Peggy, I'll get you to go ahead and uh, drop in the Matt Vincent video. You know, as a history teacher, and I've taught for 17 years, I've taught uh, U.S. history and world history and military history, and I always thought I did it right. But when I got here, I found out that I was still completely wrong. Um, and the reason I'm wrong is because the Holocaust needs more than a face, you know. And I think these eyewitness testimonies, they give it much more than a face. They actually give it a soul. I'd never been to the USC show a site before. I'd never seen any of the testimonies before. But once I saw them, I knew that it was something I needed to do. Um, and we all know as teachers, too, that we only want to use things uh, that are user friendly. Uh, but the Shoah Foundation and the Eyewitness site, you know, it, for a teacher, it's great. Uh, you point, you click, you, you drag, you drop, and, and it works. And, and so that's great for us. When I go back to eastern Kentucky, um, you know, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, we don't have a whole lot of uh, diversity. Um, we don't have um, very many different ethnicities or different religions or different races. Um, and so my challenge when I go back is I want to take these stories and I hope that my students will be able to look at these testimonies, be able to relate it to U.S. history, but also be able to use it to combat racism and prejudice and bigotry today. You know, my main goal is to create a better student, a better person, better citizen of the world. 
And uh, I'm just so thankful that I got a chance to be here today because I think it's really going to change the way I do, uh, do some of my teaching in the future. hear it or if you didn't get to hear it that you can um, see it another time and I think that's it for me so I went a little uh, longer than I planned to but I get excited about this and I can talk about it forever just ask Rob thank you so much Corey um, I did capture some questions I think you answered about how to sort by foreign language, uh, either by country or by the language itself. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, the 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 website itself is in English. Um, we mm -hmm. do have activities that, and we're always looking for new activities to publish that are in different languages. So we've just published three in Czech. We've got Hungarian and Polish activities coming. I anticipate a Spanish one mm -hmm. um, by September. Uh, two French ones coming online. One from Canada and one from France. Dealing with what, and the one from Quebec is is quite specifically historical. The one from France is really about understanding others and um, and uh, and respect. And we hope to publish that one in the fall. Um, and we'll also have the the Google Translate function that you can click on and change the page. But when mm -hmm. you're doing your search, you can also filter your testimony results by language and or often to just where the country has been taken. Um, the testimony was taken will give you a, a, a good result as well. Great. I also captured a question about the age for the video challenge, what grades? Yeah. So it's, it's middle and high school, so what we're mm -hmm. counting as grades 6 through 12 or grades 7 through 12 I think is what Rob wrote. Um, so we had quite a few middle schools um, and junior high school. We had mm -hmm. after school programs of students at that age as well. And if there's just a student who wants to be involved but not a whole class, a teacher still has to create the group and then invite that student in, but that's perfectly acceptable as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, are there permission forms, training videos, sample interview questions for students to create video testimonials of others? Uh, so that we don't um, have that in particular. Um, watching mm -hmm. a testimony gives the students a fairly good idea of how to do uh, um, an interview if they they themselves want to go and mm -hmm. take testimonies. Um, we have worked with a couple of projects around the country where the students are continuing to um, develop those interviewing skills. Uh, and certainly the School of Social Work here deploys the video testimonies to understand how to interview someone who's had a traumatic experience, um, and you can see those. Those you can, um, and that's where one of the research functions and eyewitness can be very, very helpful. Um, you can also have a look at the material and see what questions were ans um, asked of the uh, PIQ via the VHA mm -hmm. online. Okay. Uh, can this? Qu I'll read this question verbatim. Can we interview Ruth? or others via Skype or Google Hangouts? Um, we haven't had that um, request, but certainly mm -hmm. Ruth has gone on to speak at a number of events. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to send me an email, we can see about setting that up. Ruth, mm -hmm. Ruth we often Skype with Ruth, um, so I'm sure she would be willing to do that if it didn't uh, um, get in the way for <laughs> class time. So oh, terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, does anyone have any other questions from the group? Because those were the ones that I gathered from the chat as you were presenting, Corey. Okay. I mean, one of the the questions we often get is um, is really about you know how teachers can deploy it, and mm -hmm. it's the the best way to get a sense is to Register, log on, have a look around, um, look at some of the activities, and read on the activities you can read the um, 
uh, some directions up here on the mini quest of how to deploy it. But there's also mm -hmm. a section on the front page, you don't have to log on, um, called Share. And there's a number of teachers who talk about how they've deployed iWitness, and that can be um, very helpful. When we were in Poland, we had all of our teachers who were on the program pitch ideas about what kinds of activities they wanted to build using test testimony. And they were thinking about everything through an activity on eyewitness to just using the material from the watch page where they would show a video clip and have a, a kind of a one page graphic organizer to help students um, unpack it. And that you know that range um, of activity is available um, for teachers to do and just to get a sense of. Um, we do have an educators page in eyewitness and that has um, links to other webinars, it has tours, it has all sorts of introductory material. The video editor, again, everything that you need to use eyewitness is in eyewitness, so you mm -hmm. never run into that problem of having to download something or, you know, I didn't remember this miss or, you know, what have you. So um, the video editor that's uh, integrated into eyewitness is WeVideo, and so there's a whole set of how to use WeVideo, and it's a very sophisticated video editor for online video editing, so as opposed to students downloading and then um, video editing, they use it um, up on um, an online. So um, Jackie's question, do we ever do live events where students can ask a genocide or survivor question after their talk? Um, we do through our program Echoes and Reflections occasionally have um, a process or do a, a special event. Sometimes at Yam Hoshua, we do um, events where we have survivors come with us. Generally, the, if we go back to the mission, we are about using testimony in education, and that takes uh, many different forms. That said, we don't have, I don't have kind of a, a ledger of um, survivors in uh, neighborhoods around the US. I generally direct folks to their local Holocaust or genocide uh, center, education center, or museum to help identify um, those uh, those individuals who are still up to speaking. Um, mm -hmm. And again, we're coming into a time where that's going to be fewer and fewer. Uh, I was talking to someone from the US, Holocaust, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and next year they will have six docents who are still survivors, which is hugely reduced because they've that's been their largest group of, of uh, docents. Mm -hmm. Well, terrific. Wonderful information for us today, Corey. Great. Thanks so much. I think we'll go ahead and, and do the wrap up part. Uh, Peggy, do you want to talk about this slide? Well, I sure do. And I want to say thank you so much, Corey Street, for sharing with us today. It's a new resource to so many of us, and I know that there will be many others who will be watching the recording um, to learn about it. We feel so blessed to have resources like this to bring these experiences to life for students. So valuable. Um, our shows are every Saturday, so we'd love to have you all come back any Saturday and join us. We have quite a variety of topics, as you can see. Um, we haven't yet finalized next week's show, so you're going to have to come back and be surprised. But we won't have a show on April 4th, because that is Easter weekend in the United States. We have a great show with Kyle Shutt on Discovery Education, Virtual Field Trips, and other free resources. So we're really looking forward to that. April 18th, we have Susan Oxnavad, whom all of us know as the ThingLink guru. And she'll be sharing amazing things that we can do with ThingLink. April 25th, we'll all be joining in on the Den Spring Virtual Conference. So we won't have a show that day so we can participate. And our next featured teacher is Lisa Parisi, and that will be on May 2nd. She is an incredible global educator, and in fact was one of the top 50 in the recent global educator contest. Some of you may have been following that. So we're thrilled with all the shows that are coming up, and we hope you'll join us. 
The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkendon's latest venture. He's gathered together all of his professional development resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar. You can host your own webinar in a Blackboard Collaborate classroom for free as long as you make the session public so that other people can join. The Nominate a Featured Teacher link is here. And this is where you can nominate a, a teacher for the monthly featured teacher show. And you can nominate yourself as well. The, as you exit the, the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. If it doesn't, you can take the link that will be in chat. And, or you can take the link in the Live Finder in that Resources tab. So there are numerous ways to get to the survey. Once you do have the survey at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. And this will also print out with your name now. It has for the last couple months. Uh, please, though, use a personal email address rather than a school email address because school email servers tend to block you from receiving the certificate. The archives are also in a video collection and an audio collection in iTunes U. So there are many places to get recordings of past shows. There's also an RSS feed of the show archives available on the web page. Special thanks again to Corey Street, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thank you so much for coming.